All right. So this week we're going to go over a bunch of different um, open source and passive tools. Not all of them are passive, but the vast majority of them are either open source or they are free to use for the initial stages of an external external penetration test or for uh, setting up to start doing some social engineering. Uh, the way, way we're going to approach that is Dane Piaz and I are going to sort of tag team it. Dane leads up all the social engineering for uh, Go Vanguard these days. So uh, what I'll do is first go over a whole bunch of these different tools for the technical side. And then once we finish up on that, hand it over to him and he'll lead through some more on the social engineering side of it. So I put this uh, Notion page together for you guys for a reference. It's got all the it's got all the links to check out. It's got even uh, some syntax here in Markdown. But the majority of it's going to be just me going along through it, demonstrating how all these uh, tools work, sort of why I would use some over the other, how why some are good to corroborate each other. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that and let me know if there are uh, any questions on it. There's, it's a, looks like a small group tonight, which is great. So feel free to just jump in and cut me off. If it's five people, you don't need to use the raise hand function or anything like that. So um, if you do, if you do want to follow along, go ahead and use the Notion page, and you can target whatever I'm targeting if you want to. Uh, anything that we're doing on here, you certainly can run in Windows, no problem. I'm going to do most of it that isn't on just open source websites, just in WSL on Windows, because I've already got the things that are installed on here. And the first one we're going to start with is uh, subdomain, subdomain enumeration. So a lot of times when you do a pen test, let me just adjust my lighting here a little bit. Especially if it's a black box pen test, you might be given a whole big target list of all the domains and IPs, which is really, really convenient. Or you might have to do the more reconnaissance side of it where they'll just tell you that their company is called whatever Sky Zone. And then you've got to go out and do all the passive recon and come up with what you think is the list of assets that they own. Send that to them, then they confirm yes or no, that's us, that's not us, that is us, all that. So. There can be obviously many, 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 many subdomains off of one root domain. So finding a finding a good comprehensive list of all of those is usually one of the first steps in any kind of reconnaissance from a technical side of things. And one of the most well known tools to do that with is called Amass. By, it was made by OWASP. So if we do OWASP Amass enumerate and D for domain, we can put in whatever domain we want. And it will start running. It does take it does take a few minutes, so I have it appear and completed on this prompt. And you get this nice, pretty little output where it's able to go and look up. And I think it does this mostly with uh, DNS resolution and who is info and all that. And it's able to find a whole bunch of different subdomains. Not all of them are necessarily current. Um, but looking at this list, I'm, I'm not seeing any false positives in terms of things that are definitely not us. Uh, I can tell that this was a test thing that somebody did. I don't think that's active anymore, but overall it's it's pretty good, but it's not the only way that it can be done. There's totally different techniques that I like to use to corroborate this one with. So in my first step, once I've got this list, I will usually just take this copy and paste it out, throw it into an Excel sheet and then try to do another method and probably two more methods of trying to aggregate the same information. That way I can go through and uh, deduplicate all that. I think Docker to PyRepo. OK, yeah, we'll, we will do that one in just, in just a minute for sure. So one one of my favorite ones to use to corroborate a mass is this really neat free website, cert.sh. And this is actually going to look for wildcard certificates. So what, uh, what it's looking for is the SSL or TLS cert that's being used by the websites is going to spider around and try to find other instances of that same cert being used. So if it is a wildcard, wildcard can be used for multiple subdomains. That's a way of identifying it. And I usually get somewhat different results uh, this method versus using a mass. So they work well together if you just deduplicate it down. Takes just a couple seconds. Hopefully their servers aren't in South Florida. No, we're good. So this has actually found a few other ones that are indeed legit that Amass did not, like chumbucket.govanguard, that's a thing that Shane uses, uh, reports. www is actually is technically a subdomain. That's just a, a nice thing. Remote Assist Pro. So this is this one isn't uh, this did not come up in uh, Amass, but that is something that we use. We actually use it for um, 
managing our virtual machine instances. So it's 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 a really cool, easy, free tool to use. It get it's very verbose, so you'll have there's not really any easy way to export it, which kind of sucks. So you just have to you know, copy and paste the whole thing, dump out all these columns, and deduplicate. And Excel is the fastest way to do it. Um, I'm sure somebody could easily write a script to do it even faster than that, but Excel doesn't take that long. Third method to do it, which you really like, and Dan, did you did you add this one into the list? Yes, this was this was me. Okay, yeah, security trails. This is a pretty cool site. I've used it a couple of times. Uh, Dane tried to pull a fast one on me, tossing a new tool into the Notion page 15 minutes before we jumped on here. But I've actually seen this one before. Um, so they've they've got a. You can log in. You can buy a corporate version. They can actually do a lot of really neat stuff. But their domain lookup is, I think, actually pretty good. So if we just type in Tesla.com. I'm sure there's some kind of rate limit on how many you can do without the API key, but if you just need to do a few, uh, it, it is pretty effective in its subdomain search. And again, the same thing. I would copy the copy these out best that you can, combine them with those other lists, deduplicate it down, and then treat that as your initial target list, at least for that domain. They could certainly have many, many more domains, but for that domain, that's generally how I would approach a subdomain enumeration process. Any questions on any of these three? Nope. Cool. All right. The next one we'll go into is uh, what Andreas put in the chat there, uh, dork, the dorker.py and the Google dorking. So I think based on, based on the group that's in here, I don't need to explain what Google dorking is. That's great. Dump that out. Uh, there is, if you didn't know, a big, big Google, uh, Google dork database on ExploitDB. It's got all kinds of really neat stuff. Um, but we've got a bunch of them that we particularly like. And what's more than that is we have a really neat little Python script that can automate doing that for multiple files at once and even does a little bit of uh, adjusting the rates to help you get around CAPTCHA issues. So just real quick to find that link. It, it, it's not its own repo. It's part of another repo. That's probably why it's... Uh, I think it's in the pen test scripts or pen test. Yeah, pen test scripts. Yeah, so it is right in there. So Travis, I'm glad you brought up the captcha. So that's a problem I've had with the Google dorking trying to automate it is I get hit by that bot detection a lot. Yeah, yeah, and we and we do too. Um, we can usually get through a few different uh, endpoints sequentially before we before it does get get us with that bot you can adjust the uh, jitter and the timing in the script a little bit more to lengthen that out a bit but it's not a it's not a foolproof bypass for that by any means do you have something dennis uh, <laughs> well i don't know if i want to add this input or not but <laughs> But uh, theoretically, yeah, you could maybe get around it. I've never needed to mess with this too much, but I know a great way to get around it is if you can get, I mean, depends on what you're doing with it, but having uh, private IP space proxies is another way you might be able to bypass that. But that's kind of gray on TOS, so. <laughs> okay. Well, if you want to pull in a pull request, you go right ahead. Like the botnet <laughs> is what you're saying? Yeah. No, no, no. There, well, I, I, I don't ask where they get the IPs. There are some providers out there that you can actually um, get uh, Comcast and other um, IPs to proxy through. I don't ask questions about where they come from, man. I just know they exist. Uh, but the, <laughs> theoretically, you could. Well, so so the thing that I, I know there's that that gray area that you were kind of hinting at. But you know, if it's our jobs to emulate the attackers, and that's what the attackers are doing, then um, you know there's a case for that. We do run into we do run into that problem sometimes, um, mostly in the sense of um, some items saying, "Oh, you should only attack it in a certain pattern." And I know Travis has probably run into this a couple times as well, where they put limitations on you and say, "Oh, no, no, no." You can only hit this endpoint, or you can only do this or that, which is ridiculous. I mean, you have to comply with it because it's customer request. But at the same time, I agree with you. You know, the attacker is not going to care what you scope as. You know, this is this or this is that. But um, yeah, there, it's unfortunate, but you do have to comply with what they ask. I'm pretty sure also using a botnet is not an adherence with Google's terms of service, and we're all legit Probably here, not. and we're not going to use a botnet not. for this. Oh, no, I'm not suggesting a botnet. They do actually have uh, providers that will give you um, IP spaces. I don't know where they actually get them from, though. I honestly don't know. 
So this this particular script is super simple. It is just a way that we loaded in a whole bunch of dorks that we like to use a lot that are good for finding like documents, any log files that are up there, login pages, any instances of it being on like paste bin sites or stack overflow references, GitHub pages, anything like that. We've had a lot of success with these, but it's really easy to add in more other custom ones if you want to. And what's neat is that we can you can point it to a file instead of just doing it one thing one at a time. Uh, so let's take we'll take a quick look at that. So you just got to give it a targets file. Yes, I use nano. I'm not ashamed of it. I don't care what your opinion is on Vi. So uh, Python 3, dorker.py. And it takes a little bit because we have a five second delay between the request, but it just cycles on through. And what's neat is when one does pop up and one should turn uh, active for at least our GitHub page and subdomains and uh, possibly an S3 thing, I don't quite remember. Uh, it'll give you the exact uh, hyperlink that you just have to copy and paste into your web browser to get the Google results from it. So you don't have to try to go recreate this and and all that. So we'll see just in a second here, we'll have a red one pop up. Oh, so, look at that. So on this topic, so you used a, a targets file. So uh, do you know if it has or will in the future have a function where you can feed it uh, essentially like a word list of dorks? It does not have that function. But not feel free to pull definitely. in a pull request. Yeah, so yeah. I think that that would be interesting to me. So as you find ones that you like or or find that are no longer, uh, you know, leading to results, you can just modify that rather than having to change the script. Yeah. A few minutes before we started, I, I ran this a couple times just to make sure it would work here live on the video. And here you can see it. I, I got hit by that by that capture thing already. So yeah, it okay. is uh, it is always a struggle on that. But in the case you, that you do have a red one here, you just pop that right on into your web browser. And it's just a little bit of a time saver. Sweet. So that's a pretty sophisticated dork. It looks like there was different conditions or or things it was looking for, not just like uh, a string, like the most of the ones that I've seen. Oh yeah, you wanna check it out again? Yep. So it's look, it looks for all these different types, these types of files individually, or oh, and different uh, syntax error messages that are associated with different things, like PSP parse errors and warnings like that. So. Yeah, they're 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 pretty handy. We don't get a lot. The only ones we get a lot of false positives on is uh, like GitHub Stack Overflow and Pastebin, and that's usually if the company's name is something fairly common, or it's a couple words, and one of the words is common. Um, like I, I remember doing this once for um, a electric car company. It's not Tesla, and it was it it just kept telling me that the Future Farmers of America website was their stuff, and it just it just wasn't. Yeah, so it's never going to be perfect, but yeah, these ones are pretty good, especially the ones for the config files and database files. Sweet, cool, thank you. We've also had a lot of good success with uh, just looking for Word doc files. I think about a year ago, uh, we found one that they that uh, it was just like a new employee guide or something like that to set up your workstation, but it was like obviously not intended to be exposed. But we were able to pull that down and. Uh, just look at the metadata and see who created it and who it was sent to and all that. And one of our social engineering campaigns was actually sending up, an, sending out an updated version of that impersonating the guy who made it for the company. And I think that oh, one neat. actually got us some pretty good results. That was a couple of years ago for um, a big one. That might have been before you, Dan. I think that was maybe the year before you. All right, cool. Double, let me double check. So I'm going in order here on what's next. Secret searcher and secret scanner. These are really, these are really neat. Uh, I think I have this installed too. Yeah. All right. So this is a this is a really interesting tool that originally Shane made Christian's brother. He he made the Bash version, and then Dan, uh, Dennis made the Python version of it really recently. Uh, and this this is another really simple tool where essentially what it does is you give it any sort of 
code or a you know, client side HTML or a GitHub repo or anything you want, any any file directory you want. And it was going to search for it through a bunch of regular expressions to try to see anything that commonly looks like hard coded credentials, API keys, or anything like that with a whole bunch of different uh, regex. And it's really fast and it's it's really quite easy to use. So I'll just show you an example. And I actually got I actually got hit on this last week with a bunch of people who had just riddled riddled their application with hard coded API keys all over the place. So if we just grab we'll just grab any old source code just to illustrate the point. I'll just copy and paste this. This looks just like hacking in movies. OK. A bunch of stuff scrolling across the screen. Exactly. So super simple. Uh, search text sh, and then we just give it the. Oh, that's it, and it's done. Uh, even if you give it, even if you did the whole website, it still is very fast. The Python one is maybe even a little bit faster, but this output looks really pretty. But it's just it's just searching for uh, case and case insensitive versions of all these different common ones like this would be commonly for like a JWT and various other uh, interesting things that you might want to take a look at. Now this one is a little bit more prone to false positives, so you definitely get, but it will give you a nice little output of you know this this line this file go look at this one and then you can go and you can double check but it's a little bit of a time saver for doing that kind of an analysis. And moving right on. Any questions on the the Python one works exactly the same way. It's just Python. Unless there's it any difference. Has, it also has command line options. <laughs> but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 pretty good and it's pretty well optimized as well. So you're going to get good performance on both of them. Yep. Next up, I think, Cam I think Cameron had a question actually, Charles. Oh, go ahead. Uh, what key things are you looking for in Secret Searcher? Cameron? Sub, oh, subdomain enumeration. Well, if we look at this one as an example, I would want to go to and check out every one of these just to see what was on there, but especially things that are looking a little bit different or things that I either would recognize as being obviously interesting. Like I'm not seeing a VPN.govanguard, but that would be really interesting. Um, but the one that jumps out to me right away here is Remote Remote Assist Pro. Just the word remote in it has tells me that that's something that's worth looking into. But really all of them, you're going to want to do some level of analysis looking at because you know, they could be totally, totally different uh, services per subdomain that might have additional vulnerabilities that the root domain doesn't. So it's not like uh, I don't really have a, a checklist. A lot of it comes down to a little bit of gut and experience when you're going through the list, seeing which ones you want to spend more time on than others, because it can get it can make the scope absolutely enormous, and you're gonna and you have to really come really get used to uh, some automated tooling to get you a little bit more information so that you can you know determine you can't spend you can't spend five minutes on every subdomain when they give you 600 IP addresses. You, know, you just can't. Is there a tool, Travis, just speaking on this topic? Um, I assume there is. I don't know what it is, and I'm sure that if it didn't exist, it wouldn't be too terrible bad to write one. Is there a way to view like screenshots of each of these pages like emulated in a browser? OK. Yeah, um, so we internally use pen test tools for that, the web recon uh, scan and gotcha. pen test tools. That's what it does. It looks for 80443, 888443, goes to it, takes a screenshot, puts it in a nice little pretty view for you. There is another open source tool. I think it's called like Screenshotter or, or something like that that can do it. And because I know that's the that's the tool that gets called by Legion because Legion will do that uh, if you were to, if you were to use your scope uh, if you were to put your scope into Legion. Uh, if you put too big of a scope into Legion, of course, it's going to explode. Go witness. Yep, that one that one yeah. works really well as well. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I figured they could use Chrome Headless for it. I just wasn't sure what the tool was that uh, could be used for that. I've never needed to use it, frankly. Yeah, so I'd actually heard of a project that does goes a step beyond that, and they use AI to analyze the images. Um, and, and using that, they can, I guess, identify interesting uh, web, web pages or screenshots. Oh, that's cool. So that was, yeah, that was something I heard of uh, a while ago. That's not GoWitness, is it? No, uh, it was some researcher. He was writing a blog article on it. And I, I don't remember the details, but I just thought, oh, yeah, that'd be interesting. Instead of you having to uh, scour through all, you know, thousands of images, you don't know, have some tool that would do that for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Next up is Shodan. I think everybody here is probably f pretty familiar with it, but just as a really quick way, uh, way of look, way of searching for internet connected devices and websites all over the place. You can do a lot of really powerful stuff with Shodan on the free account. You can also pay money and get the API key and have uh, a few few more options for it. It's actually a little bit expensive, I think, for for personal use. But once in a while, they'll have a sale for like students or random people. That's really cheap, but. Um, you can t you can look at IPs and get and get some good initial information. I like that. Get an idea. Oh, here's the server. Here's the ports that are open. You can look at you can look at historicals on it. Good way to get information that you would also you could also easily get with Nmap. This is totally passive. They don't know that you're doing it. You're never going to get caught doing this. Uh, but another really fun feature about Shodan, which makes it a little scary, is that you can also search for specific ports or services. Like if you want to look at everybody in the world who's got Telnet open, here's a quarter million targets for you to do. And I'm sure it wouldn't take too terribly long to scroll through and find one that's the ba that the banner just said it just allowed anonymous authentication. Easy picking. You can also do it looking for specific technologies. So like uh, the F5 big IP load balancers had a pretty had a pretty big exploit come out about them come out on them about two months ago so it's like a super easy point and click rce for may i see those a lot on internals but sometimes you see them externally too you now here's 1700 possible ones that you know hackers could easily check out so very powerful tool very very neat thing if you do have the api key then we have a tool i have not used it in quite some time oh cool Eyeballer. Neat. We'll definitely check that out. Have used in quite some time. We have one in our GitHub called Pi Shodan, which is just a way to use the API key. You feed it a list of input file, input targets. It gives you an Excel out with all the information. Nice way, nice way to automate that if you're doing it in mass and don't want to use something like uh, like an Nmap or a Legion or a pen test tools or something else like that. Uh, so so I guess one thing I wanted to mention about Shodan that I found out recently. Mm -hmm. So I didn't realize that people are using the hash value for the favicon. I think that's how you say it, those little icons when you visit a page. Yeah. That they use the hashes for those to identify systems. So like, let's say you, you're interested in finding VMware uh, Horizon, that little icon that they, you know, they, they serve up. Yeah. Um, you can search for that hash and then find you know, instances of that. I thought that was really neat. No shit, I had no idea. That's cool. Yeah, that's a neat trick. And next next one down, Gray Hat Warfare. If you've been coming to these long enough that you remember uh, Andreas's um, talk on pen testing Azure, he went, he went through this, went through a lot of really fun, really good uh, ways of utilizing it. I'm going to do it a little bit of a simpler way. This is a really good, easy, free site. You can log in. Again, there's no need to. There's no there's no reason to pay for these people. It works fine, just just like this. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to search for publicly exposed cloud assets. It can do Azure Blobs. It can do Amazon S3 buckets. Frankly, it can do a lot more than that, but that's primarily what we, what we utilize it for. Most of the time, it ends up being some S3 buckets that people just didn't know was exposed. But we'll look at look at someone who's got a bazillion of them probably yeah and so you got all you got all these different things that are exposed now some things are exposed per, on you know on purpose right so they they need this is just a picture that's a picture that's on one of their sites and they have to store it somewhere to be able to call it on their sites that's not a big deal but depending on you know what information is in there it could it can be a huge deal we had a we had a client um couple months back that had 
a t like almost all of their uh, infrastructure infrastructure seem like wide uh, infrastructure, but all their storage on S3 Buck is just wide open to the whole world. And somebody figured that out, and then they ended up getting a whole lot of Amazon charges after that breach when the guy just kept spun spinning up more and more and more and more and more uh, VMs for ne nefarious purposes. They got lucky it wasn't a huge ransomware, but it was also still pretty bad. Pretty, pretty poor hygiene on that. So I think at this point, it would be time to hand it over to Dane for some of the social engineering side of it. And then if we've got time at the end, we can, we'll circle back to doing some of the threat intel options and then look at a really cool resource from our OSINT tools there at the end. So, Dane. All right, let me share out real quick. All right, can, can you all see that okay? Should be the GitHub LinkedIn username. Yep. So we'll start with LinkedIn username first. Uh, so with social engineering, one of the key features is being able to identify how we're going to reach our targets. And the tools that I'm gonna go through mainly focus on the different ways to confirm and validate how we're going to reach our targets, whether that be for um, uh, like a phishing with email or a vishing with, with phone or smishing or even a combination of all three or just a couple. So the first tool that I want to go through quickly, and I will note that I tried to uh, do a demonstration um, basically uh, prior to this, but I couldn't get the tool working. Uh, I think it's uh, actually on one of our sock puppet LinkedIn accounts. There's something funny with the phone number um, uh, complaining that it's not set up, but that's neither here nor there. So I'm just going to go through the GitHub uh, just to uh, pretty much explain what it is. And the GitHub does an, uh, obviously a very uh, fantastic job breaking down what it does do and what it and, and I'll kind of explain what it doesn't do. So as you can see here, this is kind of what an out, output would, would look like. So the goal of LinkedIn username is the employees that are associated with a company. Let's say Tesla, since uh, I think that's been the uh, the example of the night, and I think I use that in some of my other examples. So uh, with Tesla, all the employees that are associated with the company, you can scrape with LinkedIn username and get an output like this. And now what's key about this output is first initial, we'll take this this line right here, last name is a common email structure. So first initial, last name, at domain. So basically what LinkedIn username does is generate these usernames for you. So it's not an email, like basically validator or for accuracy. This is just to get usernames. The other tools that I'm going to show you are how to validate, aggregate, and also just to you know find the emails uh, right off the bat. But LinkedIn username is a great way to start because if a organization has thousands upon thousands of employees, it will generate this text file with a first name dot last name like Joe dot Schmo for us to be able to use um, and manipulate for other tools to then aggregate and validate the emails. So LinkedIn username, one of the great tools to start with. Um, and it helps lead into uh, some of the other you know, key tools for you know, act, act, actually validating them. And one of the next tools um, that I really think so, is... So sorry, I have a question about that yeah. one. So is that looking at the contents of like the individual profiles or is that looking like at the URL? Oh, good question. So I think I, I I probably glossed over this. So I think it looks at the the contents of the profile. So okay. if the profile name, like for me, it would be Dane Piazza. It just links that profile to the, the company uh, page itself. I see. Okay, cool. Thank you. And you're also going to get a lot of garbage. Everybody who puts like 35 certifications after their name, that's going to get dumped in there. If it's, if their name, if they have like a nickname on there that's not on there, it's not it's not perfect, but it is fast. It's also really good if you are allowed to do password spraying. It's an easy way to get the target list for that too. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, Joe Schmo CPA, and it creates you know a different line that's just CPA, and that has to be cleaned out. But you know, one of the one of the minor uh, issues with it. Um, you get so what you pay the for on these free things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so speaking of which, so this is a tool that you can use a free version of, um, or you can pay for it. Um, 
we have the paid version and it is probably by far one of the best tools I think I've I've seen when it comes to identifying and being able to aggregate large lists of emails uh, for target organizations. So this is called Scrap, scrap.io. Um, it is a credit based uh, service. So you get 50 free credits and feel free to try this if you'd like. So basically it's like a token um, type. The more emails that you find uh, doesn't mean that you have to use all your credits for them. Like if you want to target 50 people in their C-suite or, you know, five people in their C-suite, then you can use the free credits um, to uh, accept them and put them into a list, which you can see here is test Tesla list. Uh, but anyway, so what this tool does is it's another uh, email finder and the more information you feed it, the better your results. Uh, so I didn't know where Tesla is located. I think it's uh, they have factories in Austin. I'm you know, they're global, so I don't exactly know where they're headquartered. I'm pretty sure it's Austin, but all I did was feed the uh, the company name itself. So if we do Tesla and it'll come up with some, you know, associated companies as well, but Tesla dot com with uh, I believe that's 10,001 plus leads and of course if you're you know targeting a smaller uh, Austin's right okay perfect if you target a smaller organization it's important to know kind of where they're headquartered because you know if if it's just company dot company dot com like that may be you know difficult to find as compared to company one dot company dot com not the greatest example but to kind of illustrate the point, the more information you feed, the better the results. So if we click on Tesla, uh, it's going to drop down all these emails. And one of the cool things is you just click, keep clicking show more results. They just keep filtering in and you can save them to a list. So if I save this bad, uh, this bad boy Roshan to our Tesla test Tesla list, I should have named that something different. Um, it'll come back with uh, the email and a verification this is this green check mark uh let's see and it'll provide a little bit more information so what what this person does where they're located um, headquarters yep austin texas and just a really good amount of uh, initial data and one of the other cool things about scrap is if you just have an email uh, let's just say you know you know someone that works at tesla but you don't know their email structure so you can just put in first name last name and their company web website and it'll validate you know what they think or what scrap thinks is the correct structure of the email so in this case i believe it's uh first name initial yeah for roshan last full last name thomas and then at the domain name uh let's see so you can also do a bulk email find as well uh, so you can upload a CSV and you can map each of the columns. So map first column to name last or second column to last name, so on and so forth. More information you feed it, the better your results. And it'll spit out a list like this with the verification. So again, I think it's one of the greatest tools that I've used. It's it's so simplistic and it finds emails incredibly fast. Um, you can do a lot with it via just searching for a company or you can you know obtain a list like maybe using linkedin username and another tool and then push it into scrap and it'll validate a whole host of emails right off the bat so i think this is a really good tool and of course you can export the data in uh, csv to then use for um, other you know nefarious purposes if you will for you know socially engineering campaigns and, and such any questions on Scrap? It's actually a lead generation company for sales, right? That's that's what the Scrap's actually supposed to be for? I believe so, yes. Cool. Yeah, so, so I guess these types of tools like this one and um, what was the other one? The one that shows you historical stuff that you showed earlier? Oh, um, security trails? Yeah. So I guess these these you know they're not necessarily free. There there may be a cost associated with them, but I guess what you're gaining is like you're saving time. So you, rather than you having to try to scrape this information yourself, you have these specialized tools that are probably not that expensive. So it's it's worthwhile to to use them. 
Well, what you can do if if it's if you have a big enough list where you don't mind a bunch of false positives is you can just use one token to get one valid email to understand the structure of how they do it. Okay. Then do LinkedIn to username to scrape it. And you've only used one of the 50 free tokens. And now you've got a list that you can at least make sure it's in the right format. Yeah, and I guess the reason I brought this up is because I've I've uh, I've tried to say, oh, maybe I can figure out how to scrape these emails from a website. Well, then I look at it and like the organization was using Cloudflare. So Cloudflare has some function where it like protects these email addresses. So all you see is like some hash that gets uh, reversed using the JavaScript. So mm. doing it with like Python, it's not you're not going to get the email. You have to like you have something that interprets as JavaScript. You can actually um, you can actually reverse that that algorithm. Um, I've run up against that. Um, that algorithm can actually be reversed. It's been Literally. the same for like yeah, it's been the same way um, for like I think it's been like four or five years. The Cloudflare email protection is honestly a joke. It's it once you reverse the algorithm. I think there's GitHub repos that even do it. The okay. algorithm doesn't change. It only requires. Um, I, in fact, I don't even think that the, the uh, salt that it uses with it changes. I think it's the same, but I, I know what you're talking about. And I, it's just a joke. It doesn't, it's, you can reverse it pretty easily for that. But okay. the other thing I would say to consider is that something, um, I don't know uh, if I, I may have missed it, but um, a company like Scrap probably also pays in some cases um, for lists for lead generation. So even if you did scrape all of this, there's a potential that Scrap has stuff that you couldn't find online. I see. Yeah, it, it was just with the time that I had, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to have time to like try to figure this out. So I just moved on. But yeah, that was a little discouraging. Like, oh, that was not going to be as easy as I thought. I just expected it to be handed to me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, if, if you really wanted to get crafty, I'm sure like there there's some other tools that I'll demonstrate. So I mean, if, if you just got free trials for all of them, I'm sure it could, it could be done. Um, I know it's not it's it's a way may not be the fastest way but uh scrap and i think there's another credit based one's called uh lucia uh not demonstrating it tonight but also um helpful in uh pulling emails uh, the structure and it's a credit base so if you're targeting a specific group of individuals like in their financial department for instance you can just use the credit the free credits for that okay uh, Cool. Yeah, this is new to me. I haven't seen this one. I've only heard like Hunter IO. Um, so this one's neat. Perfect and, segue. And next in, up, Hunter IO. <laughs> perfect segue into Hunter IO. So this one uh, I primarily think is the the best use for this one and the next one. Uh, I'll, albeit, there's probably a lot more that I don't know about it, but just you know, using some of the free functionalities. Uh, Hunter.io is fantastic for uh, identifying the com the most common pattern. Uh, so, for instance, first last name, and this is what we saw in Scrap was, uh, excuse me, first initial, first name initial, and last name. So, uh, it's a great way to just triple check and validate, like, okay, is is what Scrap pulling? It seems like I'm getting a lot of false positives, or it seems like a lot of them are incorrect. Let me go use Hunter.io. Uh, to just uh, quickly validate and and see if I can't uh, identify the structure, um, because I think Hunter IO does a really good job at providing that at the minimum. I don't know um, too much else about the other functionality uh, because I, I truly just come here to put in the company name and then identify the uh, the email structure. Uh, the next one though, so I really I really do think that this is another fantastic tool. So this one's called Voyola Norbert, uh, and I may be mispronouncing that. If I am, uh, my apologies, but I do believe that is the correct pronunciation. Uh, so I won't uh, log in. I do have a free trial, uh, but I think this little uh, demonstration video is absolutely fantastic, aside from me just clicking around. Uh, so Voyola Norbert, it, it can do a lot of the same things that Scrap does, like pretty much exactly what, what Scrap.io does. But uh, Voila Norbert, uh, from my uh, personal interactions with it, it has been pretty much dead right every single time. I don't think I have had one uh, wrong. Uh, 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 well, yeah, you're probably right, Mick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but when it comes to Voila Norbert, I don't think I have one 
had had one incorrect hit. It is incredibly accurate. I don't exactly know how it's so accurate, but I know that it is. And I'll just jump to the Notion page real quick. So uh, if you see, it's probably maybe a little difficult, but so I, I went ahead and put my first uh, first name, last name, and the domain, domain name. This is my email. Um, and this little green dot right here. So if I were to hover over that, uh, it's basically going to give me a percentage of accuracy and it, the green dot is 97%. I think there's a, a yellow and red and then there's one that's it's completely completely uh, letting you know that uh, this was not found. So um, yeah, I think Voila Norbert or however it's pronounced is another fantastic tool that you can use to validate some emails. And this is, you do get 50 leads free. I do have a free account that I still am using to this day. I pair it with scrap uh, so that I can come in here and just, you know, triple check and then also be able to provide that due diligence that we looked at multiple different, uh, you know, tools to ensure our accuracy. Uh, so that's it for the email type tools. The last tool that I'm going to touch on is called truepeoplesearch.com. Now, I do want to quickly note that there is a truepeoplesearch.io. I have actually had difficulty with the, the .io, but I have had success with .com. So I do point that out in the Notion page. Uh, but True People Search is a fantastic tool for people searching, uh, finding leads uh, for you know relatives or addresses, or more importantly, any types of phone numbers that may be associated with a, a certain individual for use in, in campaigns like smishing or vishing. So I went ahead and just tried to do a quick demonstration for my name and the state that I'm located in, and none of these are correct. So I, I will note that truepeoplesearch.com is not always the most accurate. Um, Works on me. I'm the number one result. You don't even need my location. Kind of sucks. It, you know, please. To... Uh, I'm second now. Second now. Okay. You can click into it. Yeah, it's it's like it's all right. I know all of those numbers. That is my home address. This website's creepy. So yes, <laughs> to you Travis... can listen to my family if you scroll down. To Travis's point, this website is definitely a bit creepy, especially if it is you know accurately pulling information for. A, an individual. So this one we use uh, in social engineering and it, you kind of have to use a bit of intuition and, and gut uh, knowing, you know, okay, I'm looking at this person's LinkedIn. There's no way that John Doe who is listed here is 30 is the same person that's pictured on their LinkedIn page who definitely looks to be at least 75. So I'm going to keep looking. Okay. I found someone who's, you know, let's just say 74. Okay. That's you know, probably close to that age. So I'm going to, I'm going to use them. It's not a, it's not a full confidence, but it definitely gets me close enough to where, uh, if, if we were targeting a large group of individuals, you know, okay, it's not a hundred percent accurate, but if it is right, then we do have potentially a solid lead for someone who's in the company. We now have their phone number. We can use it in different campaigns and, uh, unfortunately, with the amount of detail that this uh, site provides, I'm, I'm sure malicious actors can do a lot of uh, additional nefarious activities, especially targeting family members and, this, and the likes. Uh, but that should wrap up the tools that I have. The links are provided here. Feel free uh, to let me know if you have any other questions uh, on, on these tools. But that's it for me, Travis. If you want cool. to. Yeah, I'll take Unless it there are over. any questions, of course. So I do have a question. So as a lot of you know, things change all the time. So I guess what are some of the things that you're doing to kind of keep abreast of like the the latest and greatest uh, of these tools? Like uh, right now, it may be that scrap IO, but in a month or two, there's going to be someone else or another site. Um, I guess yeah, I know Twitter is often a place people say, hey, I found this new tool. Oh, fi oh finding new tools like that. Uh, yeah. A lot of... I, I get a lot of them off of LinkedIn. Just uh, all the people I follow are in the site for the same thing. So, I, so I, lot of, I don't I don't have a I don't have a Twitter or anything like that. Uh, do okay. I do I do keep up with um, like Hacker News and Leapy Computer and all that. But we 
follow quite a few different open source tools on on GitHub and uh, yeah, uh, we don't really have a we don't have an, like an RSS feed or anything that like pipes us all this great information. We should, but we we don't. Okay. Where do you where do you find them? You find well, good stuff. I I I, uh, I follow a lot of people on Twitter, um, and I get some info from that. But that's that's always the kind of thing that I'm I'm like, oh, what you know, you don't know what you don't know. It's like yeah, there's exactly. something out there that that is more useful. Um, the only time I've ever been on Twitter in my life is on Jimmy Creamer's account, social engineering people. Well, so, so you know, a, a guy a guy on LinkedIn made a comment about that. He said, you know, you get similar information on linkedin without all the all the shit because there's a lot of shit on twitter sometimes yeah. i feel like man this is not that great i should yeah. not use this exactly all right so i'll cover in a, in a few minutes here a few different uh threat intel pages and then we can uh look at a couple good resources so the threat intelligence side of the things a couple of different ways that this is applicable one, we will often look up when we're doing when we're doing external recon. We'll look up the domains that the client has in scope on uh, a lot a lot of threat intelligence databases to see if anybody has ever flagged them as being malicious before or doing anything malicious. Not that we think our client is malicious, but we've actually had it in the past where by doing that we actually identified that one of their domains was. Uh, that's that's one we're going to talk about. I've actually already got it bookmarked up here. One of the one of the domains that we had seen in the scope when we were doing this was flagged as putting out uh, malware a few months back, and that was actually how they discovered that they had had a data breach. So we, we looked and we found this info. But we, there's also the flip side of using it for uh, the pen testing side, where things like Virus Total, you can actually upload your files to to see if it matches any any signatures that's going to set off any bells and whistles. So if you made a custom payloads or you want to check to see if your payload is going to definitely get caught before you send it out on like a social engineering campaign, anything like that, uploading it onto here is not a foolproof way, but it at least give you a little bit of an idea if it's for sure immediately going to be flagged and blocked by Defender or not. It's just a nice, easy check. And same with the URLs. So if we're doing, especially like a phishing campaign, we purchase a phishing domain, maybe it's a really good one, maybe it's typo squad. We want to check in here, especially if it's one we've reused in the past to see if anybody has ever flagged it as being a phishing domain. There, we've got domains that we've used dozens of times that still to this day nobody has ever reported because typically you know, the, the notice will go out on the client side and they'll tell their SOC, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Um, sometimes their SOC reports us too fast and we and one of our really good domains gets burned before they know it's a test. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that case. So a domain that we actually bought for $1 this year was azure-microsoft.com, spelt correctly. That was available. And it got burned immediately, which I was really bummed about. So you can, you can see on here that all kinds of people, even the Russians, are flagging this as an obviously malicious domain. That kind of sucks. Uh, Alien Vault OTX is a very similar uh, thing to Virus Total. Virus Total is free ish if you want to use this API for anything or some of its other functions. Like it's got a sandbox that you can detonate malware in and all that kind of thing. That will cost you an enormous amount of money as an, for an enterprise. One of their major data sources, and, this, and they, they, they own up to this in their own blog, one of their major data sources is Alien Vault OTX which is the Open Threat Exchange, which is an open source initiative. I, th I want to say AT&T bought these guys a few years back. So this is another example of a company taking something that's free and just charging you a lot of money to use it. They do some other stuff too. And in this case, uh, Alien Vault also recognizes this domain as malicious, but it doesn't look nearly as bad. So on here you can see uh, it is definitely definitely flagged on here. It's got a pulse, it's a security pulse. You click onto that and you can get a little bit of info. Looks like seven months ago, the domain the domain was used to try to steal credentials and it got flagged. And yep, that's what I was doing on with this domain seven months ago. So there you go. And a, a third way to a third way to look up this, and this is more for uh, email. This is more for email domains. MX Toolbox can do a lot of really great stuff. So one of the one of the things that we'll use it for is just to look at uh, domain domain record. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, uh, MX records. Just typing live is tough. 
And you can see a little bit of information here. Like you can obviously right away see this is going to use an Outlook. It's using uh, Microsoft Office. Neat. You can look up uh, their SPF records, see if it's uh, see if it's all messed up. See if they have their entire like Office VLAN, Office WAN set up to be on their SPF record, which is we something we see all the time. So you can just impersonate anybody you want. But the function we're going to talk about right now is this blacklist one. Right, where you, again you can look and see if the domains are on any blacklist for email. And according to these guys, this is a okay not on any of 91 blacklists. So that's why it's important to check multiple sources on these things. Uh, I don't know how they missed this one since it's a it's, it should be fairly obvious, but indeed that they did. And, crim and criminal IP is another one that does a lot of cool stuff. The it, this is a little bit more, I think, of a visualized showdown more than it is a blacklist threat intel tool. Although they kind of sort of market it that way, but they don't even acknowledge that this domain exists. And I think the reason that is is this domain is not up like I can't go to this. I think part of this function is that it goes out to that website and then it looks at the, what is now. This website has been taken down for a long time, so it's not looking at historical data. But if we do point it at something that is current. Did I spell this wrong? Can I do this? I'm doing wrong, Dane. I don't have to do IPs, do I? It says domain search. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. I don't. Oh well, they're dead to me. Last one, then moving right along. Uh, DNS Swiss. This is a really cool open source one. There is also a command line version uh, on GitHub. Does not work for shit. It will absolutely overload your your command prompt with huge amounts of data. The the website one works great. What this will do is it will t it will take a look at other domains that are really really similar to whatever you put in there to see if there's someone who is trying to uh, register typo squatter ones or anything like that. So this is something that we do for clients, really more of a, as a courtesy. You know, if, if there's someone who is doing an obvious typo squad uh, against them, and it wasn't us that bought that domain, we'll, we'll take a quick look at that just to see if there's any, any any malicious actors that are actually setting up or in the process of launching a social engineering campaign against them. Uh, and we'll just toss that into the reconnaissance part of our report, just as like, hey, this here's additional info that we checked for you. Uh, and people and, and the clients usually really like that. Uh, it's not not too often that we see it, but it's just such an easy thing to go to go through that we we like to include that. Uh, this is also this is also a free tool that's often packaged and sold for egregious amounts of money. Rapid Seven is one of the folks. Their Insight IDR it basically is one of that functions is it does a uh, I think they call it like a dark web domain search or so they, they use a lot of really fancy terms and graphics. Uh, it's just querying DNS twists and then feeding them the same export. So, like literally the exact CSV that they can click download on right here. It's it's not even it's unabashed. So so, um, so is this one of the tools used to fund that that uh, that Azure dash Microsoft? That, oh no! I just I, I it was a good find. I just looked that up on GoDaddy. It was available on GoDaddy <laughs> okay. for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I I I know I've got really shitty other Microsoft ones that have lasted for years that nobody has reported, but that that one was like thirty minutes. It was so it was so tragic. And the last thing I've got for you guys is actually what Andres put in the put in the chat here. This is just a really neat uh, website for finding other. OSINT stuff. Uh, you know how I love these diagrams, but this one's interactive. So if you want to look at like geolocation tools, oh, look at that. So fancy. And you can keep clicking in. And if you click down deep enough, oh, look at this, Dane. Military grid reference system coordinates. What is this? It, it, it'll actually just link to all these different uh, different sub tools and you can play with these different things. Uh, some stuff on there is great, some stuff on there not so much, but it, it, is, an, it is a neat thing to play with and just see what, what other things are out there that uh, might be worth checking in that particular category. And to that, 
that's what we've got for you guys tonight. Any other questions or comments before we distribute out the uh, survey? Yeah, just one real quick thing about Scrap, I just realized. So you can, I had some previous data in there that I deleted and I got my credits back. So in, in a weird roundabout way, you could maybe, you know, 